Hello everyone, I'm meteorologist Mike Clare here at the National Weather Service in Gray, Maine. So yeah, I uh, got into this project actually because uh, Gina reached out looking for some more information on fog and um, as anyone who lives near the coast has noticed, there can be a huge difference in fog if you're at the shoreline versus just a couple miles inland, especially in the spring and summertime. Uh, so that was the motivation for this presentation. And we're going to be talking about that and uh, just a lot about fog. So I'm going to turn my video off here and we'll get started with the presentation. I, as mentioned, I'm Mike Clare here with the Weather Service in Gray, and we're going to be talking about fog along the main coast. Uh, and a little overview of this presentation. We're going to start off with fog processes, an overview, uh, really how fog forms, different types of fog, and uh, different mechanisms that actually uh, cause those different types of fogs to develop. We'll take a look uh, across the nation and across the globe, actually, at uh, fog frequencies throughout the year, uh, and we'll kind of, from there, hone in closer to home and see why uh, we see as much fog as we do and how much we see compared to the rest of the country and the rest of the world, even. Um, we'll talk a bit about the Gulf of Maine because that's an important factor in the fog that we do see around our area. Uh, then we'll talk about the local geography that helps play into the fog. Um, we'll talk more about the uh, local climate, local climatology and frequency of the fog, and also how the seasonal weather patterns change and impact uh, the fog frequency around the area. So starting off with the fog basics, uh, fog formation, uh, at the very heart of it all, fog is saturated air. So you will hear a lot of times if you're watching a broadcast presentation on, on TV or the weather, they'll talk about the dew point and the air temperature. And when the dew point and the air temperature are the same, you often have fog. Uh, the air is saturated at that point, and that's when the fog can develop. Um, and another rule is that uh, the dew point cannot be higher than the air temperature. So a lot of times what happens when we see it around here is when we get fog, it's because the um, air cools uh, lower than what the dew point is. So the air has to saturate to get that moisture out of the air. Uh, so that's the very basic of any type of fog that develops. And then Along the main coast, especially toward the mid coast, Penobscot Bay area, there's three main types of fog that are, are most common in the area. Uh, one is advection fog, and that's the one we're going to be talking the most of about tonight because that's kind of the unique one for the area or the more common one. Uh, there's also radiation fog, and this occurs in most places, uh, really anywhere that there's a source of moisture, whether it's near the water or grasslands, the forest. Uh, this happens more on those cool, calm nights. And then there's also steam fog, which we'll be talking about. And we're also going to be seeing this in the next few days. Uh, that basically happens when you have cold air over warm water. You get steam that comes up and can create that fog. Uh, so starting off with radiation fog, we're mostly going to touch upon this because uh, it's not, uh, it's kind of a universal thing around the area, not specific to the main coast as much. Uh, but the very basic idea with it is it happens a lot on the calm, cool nights. Uh, when there's no cloud cover, heat is lost into space, and that's referred to as radiational cooling. Uh, so when that happens, the air at the ground becomes the coolest air and any moisture that's in that air eventually the temperature falls to the dew point and the fog can develop and as it continues to cool through the overnight the fog gets thicker uh, and this will also happen uh, cold air collects in the lowest areas so you'll get this fog in the valleys while you can have hilltops and mountains poking out of the fog it's very common around here in the summer and especially the fall when we do have the moisture and you can get 
the uh, cooling at night. Uh, and then the other way this can occur is at night you can have the air cool over the land and then have that cool air drift out over the water. And again, this would be more in the summer and fall uh, when the water can still be warmer than the air temperatures, uh, especially late summer and fall. Um, so if the cool air drifts out over the warmer water, it can collect moisture and uh, turn into fog that way. And then from there, it can either drift back sh on shore at a later time or just move out to sea. But that's the basic with radiation fog. Um, another one is steam fog. And this, it's also re commonly referred to around here as Arctic sea smoke. Uh, it's when you have very cold air that moves out over the ocean immediately, the air's uh, there's such a big difference between the water temperature and the air temperature that the, the moisture starts rising and condensing in that colder air. So typically when we see this, uh, it would be cold, a cold wind blowing offshore. So on the mainland, you would mostly see it out, out over the ocean. But once you get out on the islands and some of the peninsulas, you could be uh, in the thick of it in the fog. Uh, so the general term for it is steam fog. It can also happen in the late summertime when lakes are still warm. You can get steam that rises off of them on the cooler nights. Uh, but at least along the coastline, it's more this uh, wintertime phenomena with the Arctic sea smoke. And with the cold air coming, arriving tomorrow, we will be seeing this over the next couple of days. So you can keep an eye out for it. And then the type of fog that we're going to be focusing on most today is advection fog. And basically, advection is just the general term for air moving from one place to another, a wind essentially. Uh, so with advection fog, generally what happens is you have air that has uh, more moisture in it. Generally, in our area, it comes from the south. It can either come from... Uh, further out in the Gulf of Maine or down south of New England where the Gulf Stream has some warmer waters or could even come up, uh, the air could come off of the coast of southern New England, drift out over the Gulf of Maine uh, where the water is colder, that causes the air to cool and then condense and then you get the fog formation. Uh, so this is one of the more common ones we see in the summertime. And th these are the kind of events where you'll have it be foggy at the coast and then clear just a few miles inland. Uh, so taking a look here across the country, I know we highlighted that uh, Maine is one of the foggier spots across the country. And here's some proof of that. This shows the average number of days with heavy fog, uh, which we define as being visibilities of a quarter mile or less. So you'll notice there's kind of three hot spots across the country. One is off in the Pacific Northwest. Another is across the Southern Appalachians uh, down around West Virginia and those areas. And then the other one is here in Northern New England and along the main coast. Um, so the one thing that you'll notice is even though the Appalachians have a lot of fog, the Rockies do not out west. So uh, you need more than just elevation to get fog. You need a source of moisture. So the Southern Appalachians, there's a lot more moisture down there. They're all forested. Um, so that's why you notice the difference between those two mountain ranges. But once you get up here into New England, we have both the ocean uh, as a source of moisture and forest, uh, mountains. We have a lot of different ingredients to help create fog around our area. Um, and then as we look here across the globe, I know I apologize that this image is hard to see. They were limited uh, images like this, but what's really interesting about this one is this shows uh, fog frequency during the summertime months and the, during the daytime. So what you'll notice is most of the world does not see fog during the daytime in the summer, but uh, the areas that do are the North Pacific, the Arctic Ocean, and then also the Northwest Atlantic. Uh, and highlighted here off to the right, 
again, it's hard to see, but what I've circled is the Gulf of Maine, New England, and Nova Scotia. So the Gulf of Maine is one of those few areas and also one of the southernmost areas that sees daytime fog in the summertime. Um, and one of one factor of that is, uh, well, there's different factors that aid in that fog formation. And that's what we're going to dive into next, the next piece of the puzzle, so to speak. Uh, there, along the main coast, the different factors that influence it are the topography, which is the elevation change along the coast and um, going from sea level up onto the hills and nearby mountains. Uh, the water temperatures, both along the coast and in the Gulf of Maine, and also changes in seasonal wind direction that we experience uh, overall. We're in the mid latitude, so we see a lot of westerly winds, but as we move into the summer, that starts to shift a bit and that aids in some of the fog frequency around our area. So starting off with the geography, uh, the main mid coast and the Penobscot Bay region have some of the highest elevations uh, on the entire east coast that close to the water. Um, so very quickly, you go from sea level up a few hundred feet and on top of Cadillac Mountain as much as a little over 1,500 feet. So uh, the southern main coast is a little more flat, but once you get to the mid coast, you have more terrain that butts up right against the ocean. And that helps uh, factor into some of the fog that develops there. Uh, and the reason for that is uh, air rises. When air rises, it cools, and when it, but when it cools, uh, the moisture doesn't go anywhere. So as it cools, we reach that dew point, the moisture can condense in the air, and that's when you start to get the fog to develop. So if you bring air in off the water and, and you force it to move up over the hills and the higher terrain, that's where you start um, causing it to cool, condense, and turn into fog. Um, Another factor that influences uh, right along the main coast is uh, the Gulf of Maine has a very dynamic system of currents that a lot of the rest of the East Coast doesn't see, um, especially the southern US. Uh, they're mostly driven by the Gulf Stream that drifts offshore. It's very warm. And then off the mid-Atlantic, mid you have uh, warm influences from the Gulf Stream and then also just a little more south in latitude, the water warms up better. But once you get into the Gulf of Maine, you have the Nova Scotia current, uh, which feeds from the Labrador current further off to the east. That brings a steady supply of cool water toward the Gulf of Maine along the coast of Nova Scotia and into the Gulf of Maine. And then from there, uh, it moderates as it moves further south. Over time, it just heats up more in the sun. Uh, during the summertime. Um, so you have the eastern Maine coastal current and that slowly brings water down the Maine coast uh, and then eventually it can continue into the western Maine coastal current. But our big focus will be from the Nova Scotia current into the Bay of Fundy and then down along uh, the down east and mid coast coastline. Um, and this is why that is so important. I'm going to let this play here a few times, uh, but this just shows uh, the changes or is the, uh, these are the water temperatures every day through the Gulf of Maine from this past summer. Uh, at the bottom, the temperatures are given in Celsius. So just a few points of reference here where you start to see the greens, that's water in the upper 60s getting into the low to mid 70s. And then any water in purple is 40s and 50s. So what you'll notice with this uh, throughout the summer, it starts off cold everywhere. And then as the summer goes on out in the middle of the Gulf of Maine, the water temperatures start to warm up, even getting into the 70s this past summer. Uh, but right along the down east coast and into the mid coast, you'll notice we hang on to those 40s and 50s all summer long, even though it was some of the warmest water on record out in the middle of the Gulf of Maine, you had colder water still right along the coastline. Um, 
And this just highlights that this is a snapshot from early August here. So you'll see uh, even the shade of yellow, uh, that's water approaching 75, 76 degrees out um, east of Massachusetts, but not too far south uh, from the main coast. But then still right along the coastline, you have that water that's about 55 to 60 degrees. So significantly colder, even though it's that close. Um, and the reason this is important is if you have water that's in the 70s nearby, that's going to be giving off moisture. Um, it can theoretically, the dew points could be as high as the water temperature itself if it was given enough time to moisten the air above it. So once you have that moisture nearby, if that drifts north, it's going to encounter the colder waters along the coastline. It's going to start to cool. And once it cools, it can condense the moisture in it and start to develop the fog. Um, and part of the reason for why you have such cold water right along the main coast uh, from down east to about the mid coast uh, is the large tidal gradients. So we have cold water feeding in from the Nova Scotia current, but then uh, along, especially as you progress further down east, the tides get greater and greater. So along the main coast, the tide ranges from about a 10 foot difference to a 22 foot difference and then even greater than that once you get into the Bay of Fundy and what that does is that motion keeps the water turning so no matter what you're going to be dr bringing up colder water from the deeper uh, deeper levels of the ocean so this is one of those things no matter how warm the Gulf of Maine gets in the summertime you're still going to have the tides changing uh, exchanging water with the lower levels uh, along the down east coast and into the mid coast and especially the Bay of Fundy and that all just keeps feeding the cooler relatively cooler water uh, into the area and that keeps uh, right near the coast those cooler water temps. Uh, so then now we start to get into the fog itself we've kind of set up the different parts that influence fog in the area um, but now we're going to kind of see some proof of how that shakes out so uh, what this shows here is the frequency of fog at Rockland uh, we only have a few sites in the area um, there's Bar Harbor and uh, there's also Rockland uh, so Rockland is kind of most representative of the Penobscot Bay area and the mid coast in general um, and there's two different parts to this graph. So uh, the warmer the colors, the more frequent the fog is at that time and that time of year. Along the bottom, it's broken out by the week of the year. Uh, so highlighted here, I've just got circled the warm season. You'll notice from May into October, we see a peak in the uh, average number of hours of fog, especially in July. So middle of the summer is the foggiest time of the year uh, along the mid coast. And then also part of that is the time of day. Uh, you'll notice from about 4 a.m. to noon, that's the most frequent time where the fog is developing. Uh, and that kind of also plays into, uh, that's when you would see radiation fog the most. So uh, you would see it late at night, early morning hours. So that overlaps with the summertime fog that we see overall, because you will notice uh, higher up on the graph, there is a little more of a secondary peak. It's not as pronounced as the lower, as the earlier times, but once you get into the evening, there are uh, more frequent events of fog just during the evening hours. And that would more commonly be that advection fog that we see coming in off the water still being around at that time of the evening. Um, you wouldn't expect to see radiation fog that early in the evening during the summertime. Uh, so uh, now that we know it's foggier in the middle of the summer, we're going to see why here with the seasonal changes in wind direction. Um, so what these graphs here are showing is essentially it's a compass rose 
and each barb is where the wind direction is coming from. It's more frequent uh, over the last um, 40 years or so. So what this shows here is in March, your most common wind direction is from between the west and the northwest. So that is mostly coming off the land. It's drier air. Uh, it's just part of the season when we're in um, the winter time. We have a mostly west wind, some direction of west coming into our area, unless we're getting a storm, in which case you'd see winds from the northeast, which you notice that secondary maximum there for the March wind directions. But then by the time we get to June, winds shift to become mainly out of the southwest, and you'll notice a lot fewer events out of the north west. Um, so here, once we have the winds out of the southwest, you'll also notice there are, aren't those warm colors we see back in March. Uh, mainly, the winds are lighter, and the color corresponds to the speed. Uh, so overall, we have lighter winds than we see in March, but they're most commonly out of the southwest. So uh, that just kind of represents the summertime. Overall, winds out of the southwest, that's bringing in moisture off the Gulf of Maine and directly on shore. Uh, and then uh, just kind of looking at the second half of the season, that's the June wind directions. Everything's still the same as what I just said about that. Uh, but then by October, you'll notice the winds start to shift back to the west again. So uh, overall, we start to lose the southwest winds. We still have some, but not as much. And uh, that's where we saw on the fog graph the kind of at the end of the summer and into the fall, the frequency of the fog was tailing off once we got later into the season. And that's part of the reason why here is uh, the winds start to shift. We start to get more dry air coming off of uh, North America and into the area, and that keeps the fog frequency down. Um, so now shifting gears a little bit, just uh, to look at the fundamentals of sea breezes, because whenever we have a wind out of the south or the southwest, it's either an onshore wind or a sea breeze, or sometimes both. So this is something along the coast everyone has experienced. We're probably uh, fairly familiar with it, but just to talk about um, the scientific side of what is actually happening when we get a sea breeze. Uh, at the start of the morning, sunny day, the sun comes out and starts to warm up the land. And the land warms up much faster than the water. And when that happens, uh, you get a temperature difference between the two. So the warm air rises over the land, and then the cold air at the surface over the water comes in to take its place. So uh, then from there, it can progress inland. Uh, the air that rises actually goes up to about three to 5,000 feet. Then it drifts back out over the ocean and descends again. Uh, so it sets up a sea breeze circulation where you have cooler air over the water coming inland. And then a lot up above, uh, the air goes back out over the ocean and sinks down. So that's why we see sea breezes in the summer. Anytime you get a warm day, a warm sunny day, you're typically going to have a sea breeze that tries to come in. And what's important about that is that wind direction from the southwest is going to be coming in off the water and into the mid coast um, and along the main coast. So when that happens, along with the cooler air, it's also bringing in the moisture from in off the ocean. So once you bring, the, uh, and that's what this graphic shows here, advection fog associated with the sea breeze. The sea breeze picks up, it pulls the moisture inland, uh, and either if there was fog out over the ocean, that sea breeze will be bringing the fog with it, or it can just bring the moisture with it. And then once it arrives at the coast, once it starts to rise, it can condense into fog or even just the differences in wind over the ocean versus the land. Uh, there's a lot more friction over land than there is over water. So once the air arrives, it starts to slow down and that can increase the moisture content locally uh, with the air along the coast. So that's why the sea breeze is an important piece of this is it's a very common occurrence and then it also brings the moisture into the area. Um, and just this is an example 
of, uh, this is comparing Rockland's high temperature to Bangor's high temperature. So not too far away, but noticeably further inland. Um, anywhere below this yellow line uh, is when Rockland's high temperature was colder than Bangor's. And then anywhere above it, Rockland was warmer than Bangor. So you'll notice from late March, all summer long and until we get almost through November, on average, Rockland is colder than Bangor. And that's where we have the sea breeze um, arriving into the Rockland area, keeping more, uh, more of the cooler air around. Um, but the other part of this is Rockland, uh, so Rockland's cooler and Bangor's warmer. If Rockland is foggy, um, but temperatures steadily warm up as you move inland because the sun heats the ground faster. As you progress away from the coastline, it steadily gets warmer. So with the warmer air, uh, you might not have the temperatures you need anymore to con keep the air condensed. So once it warms up, it's not saturated anymore and the fog can dissipate or sometimes uh, you'll hear it referred to as the fog lifted. Um, sometimes as you work your way inland, the ground might be warm enough to keep the lowest part uh, unsaturated. So it's clear at the ground, but then the fog is still up above. So those are the days you get those low clouds um, or it can be warm enough altogether to just burn off the fog and it will be sunny a few miles inland while it's still foggy right on the coastline. Um, and now with all that in mind, I'm just going to show a couple of examples here. These are some satellite images. And uh, one problem with fog along the coastline is if you don't catch the satellite image of the day it happens, it's very hard to go back and try and get that data. So I got a couple of examples here. And I know it's a little hard to see along where is where here. So I've circled the main coast extending from northern Mass up through uh, about Eastport. So all this is showing here is all inland. It's clear. Uh, southern New England is clear. And then right along the main coastline, you'll notice the fog just hanging on right um, through the islands and peninsulas during the daytime. And that's lining up right where those colder water temperatures are along the coast. So like anything, there's multiple factors that play into the development of the fog. And what we're seeing here, uh, you can kind of tell by the way the rest of the clouds are moving is we have southwesterly flow. So we have wind coming on shore along the main mid coast. Um, so that's bringing in the moisture. The moisture is going over the colder water right along the coast. And then the air is also converging and rising along the coastline, helping to keep that fog present right at the coast. Uh, and then this is just one more example. Um, I've got a little graphic here just as a reminder of the overall advection fog and the moisture sources. So the moisture can come locally. Uh, from warmer waters out in the middle of the Gulf of Maine, or it can come for over a larger area up from the Gulf Stream uh, as that air just moves north up into the northeast. It, you know, those kind of real big warm days, uh, warm and humid days where it might be foggy on the coast for a couple days straight. Um, and what the satellite image here is showing uh, is showing a few different areas of fog. So that right along the main coast, uh, you'll notice the fog holding on through this entire satellite loop. Uh, further inland, it burns off during uh, over the course of these couple hours here. Uh, but it holds on right along the coast where you have the convergence and the uh, locally cooler temperatures. Then. Off on the right side here, you just have kind of a more general area of fog. Uh, this area of fog is drifting up uh, toward the Bay of Fundy. Um, but overall, it just kind of shows that moist environment. Um, and you can have local differences in water temperature. So the waters are cooler over toward Nova Scotia, where we have that Nova Scotia current coming in. So once the air is arriving there, it's cooling and condensing into fog. Um, but then I also mentioned at 
toward the beginning that uh, fog, the moisture can drift off land from areas to the southwest. So that would be southern New England, those areas. So this in this example, and what's neat about this is you see the fog drifting uh, northeast from the coast of Massachusetts. And what's likely going to happen is as that continues to drift north, it will arrive at the main mid coast and uh, help to enhance the fog in the area. Later on, uh, this satellite image here ends uh, around mid morning, around eight to nine in the morning. So you would expect by early afternoon that that fog would be arriving. Um, and one thing that comes up is how do we actually forecast fog around the area? Uh, like anything, we have lots of different models that try to help us out, but fog, especially marine fog, is one of those things that they're not very good at forecasting. Uh, there will be times where you see the fog on satellite and there's nothing on the models. So one thing we have to do is just look at satellite images like this, see that there's fog down there, and try to time out when we think it will arrive. or if we think it will even make it, will the wind shift to offshore before it actually gets there and keep it from coming in? Uh, so those are some of the things we have to consider. But when we see a satellite image like this, we would be trying to time out where that fog is headed from what we're seeing now. Uh, so just as an overall summary for the presentation, there's many different ways that fog can form and also different types of fog. Uh, and Maine holds a lot of the ingredients for the various types of fog, um, whether it be the water temperatures, which are driven in part by the tides. Uh, it's more the, the currents in the Gulf of Maine and the tides keeping that water moving along the coastline. Um, those play into keeping the cool water near the coast while the rest of the area warms up and can create and source more moisture. Uh, the local topography, even just that small increase of a few hundred feet from sea level is enough that as the air rises, it will cool by a couple degrees and then down to the dew point where it can become saturated and the fog can form. And then also as we move into the summertime, that seasonal shift of winds to more southwest coming in off the Gulf of Maine, supplying that moisture and then lining right up with the coastline. Um, and then, uh, uh, this was talking about where, as you move inland, the fog dissipates. Uh, warmer temperatures inland can allow the fog to dissipate as it tries to drift inland um, while it remains at the coast, because es essentially, you um, uh, once it starts to warm up, the fog disappears. But right at the coast, if the wind's off the water, there's been no source of warming. Uh, because the water hasn't warmed up. So that's where you can get the fog bank right along the coast and uh, it can hang out there all day. Also, what sometimes happens with this is once we lose the daytime heating, once the sun starts to go down, that fog will push inland then because uh, the ground isn't being warmed anymore. That fog can push further inland from where it's been sitting all day. Uh, so that's an overall summary of the presentation. I'm happy to take any and all questions and I hope you got some. So. Thanks, Mike. This is fascinating. I think I might need to watch this a couple times to further understand it. Um, so we have a question. As often as not, fog exhibits a fog bank, a sharp edge to the region of fog, very often with a wind parallel to the fog's edge. Why does this happen? Yeah, so... Um... As long as, oops, sorry. as long as you can keep seeing my screen, this uh, this satellite image here kind of shows that it, it's hidden in part by the uh, uh, the clouds up above, but uh, there's uh, there's a difference in friction over land and water, and one thing we refer to is as wind comes over the land, it turns to the left. So just the difference of air, either air coming from the water onto land or land going out to water, there's a difference there which creates a slight boundary. So that change can add a sharp edge to the fog. Uh, it's more common 
uh, I mean, it happens anywhere, but uh, it, it is more common with these types of marine fog where you have it drifting around. So any kind of difference in wind direction can sharpen up the edge. Uh, but also, as we were talking about with the difference in heating, uh, as you move, if you were to move toward the coast from further inland on a warm summer day, uh, you would be getting colder and colder until finally you reach the point where fog could develop and maintain itself. And it's that boundary. It's it's pretty much all or nothing with fog. The air is either saturated or it's not. And when it's not, you typically won't have fog. Um, so that can those two factors add to why you can have such a dramatic edge with the fog bank. Um, so next question, um, are we seeing more or, uh, more or more dense fog now than say 10 or 20 years ago? Um, I don't have any record of that. Um, there, I don't know to be completely honest. We, uh, one thing we have tried to map out is how many dense fog advisories we issue. Um, and that's, it, it gives us some idea, but it's kind of also a little subjective as to, um, there's not always a hard criteria as to when a dense fog advisory would be issued or for how long. Typically it's when there's dense fog, but how widespread it is, is a factor. So just a difference in a couple miles from the coast to further inland, it, you have a difference um, of how often you see it. So you would have to kind of pick one station and see how frequent the fog occurred there. I haven't done that yet, so I'm not exactly sure. Um, but I don't, there's no strong trend that I know one way or the other at this point. Sounds like a research opportunity. Yes, yes. Uh, okay. Um, why is there dense fog on one side of a low island, but clear on the other shore? Uh, so like any s small island or? That's all I have in the chat. Okay. Um, this one of those, uh, the difference in heating between land and water. Um, once the sun is warming that land, it's, uh, it can start to dissipate the fog so you can have it change very quickly even over the course of an island um, but at the same time if you depending on how tall the island is it can alter the wind direction so if it's just a light wind generally off the water uh, the air is going to go around the island more than just straight over it. If it's a strong wind, it doesn't really matter. It just cruises right over the island. But with the lighter winds, you can have more wind around the edges than going right over it. So it can almost create a wake behind the island where the fog is getting split off to the sides. And then you have a little lull on the back side of the island where there's no fog. Um, it's not all that common, but it, it can happen. And that's usually how it happens. We have lots of questions in the chat box. I, I warned you about this. We have our oh, own no. meteorologist. We, we got time, so I'm happy to answer them. Uh, yeah, so we have the chance to ask all of our questions. So um, just kind of, this is kind of a clarifying one, but when dew point and temp are same, is fog just a maybe? Uh, it, it usually there's fog. Uh, sometimes it can just be raining. Um, and it can rain without being saturated, but usually if it's saturated and it's trying to get more saturated, it's essentially meaning the air is still trying to cool down. Uh, that's where you would have fog most of the time. Um, yeah, usually, usually if it's 100% saturated, um, you'll usually have fog. Yeah. And this is kind of repetitive, but I'm gonna ask it just to, clarify again, is the dew point itself predicted of, predictive of fog? To a point, it's, um, if you had high dew points coming up from the south, if you knew dew points were going to be pushing 70 and they're going to be running into this cold water, um, water closer to 60, 
it's going to be cooling down that air and it's going to have to condense that moisture out of it. So generally that's how the dew point can be used to uh, predict the fog, but often you basically need to take the higher dew points and cool them because uh, like inland, typically when there's a sea breeze on a real warm, muggy summer day, the dew points will be lower on the coastline simply because the water is condensing into fog or even condensing into the ocean. Whereas further inland, you can have higher dew points because it's warmer, the air can hold more moisture. Um, so it's really as you move the dew points and try to cool them, that's how you can kind of use it to predict the fog. Thanks. Okay, bear with me for this one. This sure. is a land question about very localized fog seen along 52 inland a mile or two near Lincolnville and Camden. So sometimes, okay. usually in April-ish, I have been driving along in the evening after sunset, definitely dark evening, but may have been a warming up day. If the winter had significant snow accumulation and there has not been too much melting, the fields will have considerable snow still upon them. I will be in a dark, clear, starry night and around a corner adjacent to one of these fields with snow, there is suddenly a fairly thick fog that no one expected. Is this considered advection fog? Any thoughts? In part, yes. You, what you would essentially have there is similar to what we were talking about with the cooler water along the coast. In this case, you have cooler snow on the surface of this field. So any air that drifts over that snow is going to start cooling down. And if it has a lot of moisture in it, it will cool to where the air condenses and develops the fog. So you you can get fog on any kind of small scale. It can be just a few feet deep or a few, like few tens of feet wide, depending on what's underneath it and how cool the air is around it. So definitely, um, especially in the late spring when you still have that spotty, or uh, early to mid spring really, uh, where you have the spotty snow cover, you can get very localized area of fog. Fog is so fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> uh, sounds often seem to be more clear or even louder in the fog. Is there a physical reason for that? Or am I just more nervous as I try to find a buoy? Um, that's a good question. I'm not entirely sure. Uh, typically, when it is foggy, the air is usually more calm. So either the air is calm or just the light wind. So sound will travel, like any certain sound will travel better than that. There'll be less background noise. Um, so I don't know the exact like level of sound or changes to how it travels, but just as a general observation is there's less sound overall so that the sounds that are there are more prominent. And uh, when you were discussing wind direction, you mentioned the recent period from which your data was taken. Has the predominant wind direction in the bay changed if you were to compare it to longer ago? Um, so these here, I, I don't know for sure. Um, I, I haven't looked and overall you might be able to get a very minor change over time, but the general idea, um, generally the wind directions have remained the same, but I don't know explicitly how much has changed over a given time period. Um, is it safe to say that when there is fog, there won't be much wind and thus no or few storms nearby? Uh, this is kind of a tricky one because one of the jokes around here is our worst severe weather days are when there's fog on the coast. Uh, and the reason for this is um, typically when you have sea breeze and fog along the coastline, that, that air itself is very stable. So once thunderstorms arrive there, typically they're thunderstorms feed on the uh, warm moist air. So once they arrive at the cool moist air, they typically start to weaken. Uh, but just kind of shown on this graphic here uh, with the sea breeze circulation, as you'll notice, 
um, kind of those taller clouds at the edge of the sea breeze front. So further inland, you can have the sea breeze front start to generate thunderstorms sometimes, or if storms arrive, even enhance those storms for a little bit. Uh, so if you're on the coast and in the thick of the fog, typically you won't see many thunderstorms, but just inland from there, overall the environment is better for thunderstorms on days that we actually have fog on the coast um, at least some of the higher end events there's a lot of days where it's just foggy on the coast and sunny inland um, but some of the more severe weather days still have fog on the coast um, so kind of a mixed answer there i guess <laughs> I was wondering if um, before we sign off, so we'll give people a little bit more time to think as well, but could you talk a little bit about the role of the National Weather Service, especially as it pertains to Maine? Yeah, yep. So we're located here in Gray, Maine. We forecast uh, all across. Uh, we, uh, the other office in Maine is the Caribou office and our line kind of splits at the top of Penobscot Bay. They have Bangor and then it goes up to the northwest, uh, we have Jackman. So that's how we kind of split the area. And then we also have the state of New Hampshire here. So we forecast, uh, we're the ones that issue all the warnings, um, the wind chill warning you see out currently, that's the one we did, or when your favorite TV shows are interrupted by tornado or severe thunderstorm warnings, those are from us. Um, so yeah, we, our main, purpose is our guiding mission is to protect lives and property. So that's what we focus on with the warnings. And as part of that, we issue a forecast um, at least a couple times a day uh, for the week ahead. We That's our forecast. And um, but then also in the shorter term, like today and tomorrow, we update that a lot more often. So overall, our mission here is to try to provide as accurate a forecast as possible without all the hype. Um, and then also to issue those warnings for when the weather does turn dangerous and to try to protect people, let them know what's coming uh, and when it might be coming. So that's our main mission here. Yeah, that's really helpful. Um, are there publicly accessible sites where we can see some of this data, like the wind direction, water temperatures, et cetera? Yeah, so some of the graphics I've used here, uh, they come from Iowa State. Um, and the easiest way to get to them is if you just Google the letters IEM space cow, like the animal, um, that's their data plotter and they, gather all they're really good at gathering all our information and putting it into these nice graphics and they got tons of options there so that's where you can kind of look at historical climatological data uh, but then also on our website uh, weather.gov and more specifically our office site here it's weather.gov slash gyx um, that's where you'll find all the information on our page um, both, both historical and the forecast information. Uh, you can find a lot of the historical stuff under the local climate page, uh, but then more for the forecast side, you can, uh, you can either put in your zip code or we have a map that you can click on and uh, you'll get a forecast for your area. So um, yeah, it's a mix. Historical data is located in a couple places, but then any forecast data comes from our website. Thanks. And I did find them and pop them into the chat box for everybody. Oh, perfect. Thank you. <laughs> uh, how many people are in your office? Uh, there are about 24 of us in total, and that's a mixture of meteorologists like myself that uh, work here. Um, we're on the rotating shift work, so we're the primary uh, forecasters and there are thir there's 13 of us and then there's uh, multiple levels of management uh, there's three main managers including our the meteorologist in charge uh, and then there's also the electronics technicians they help support the equipment that we use uh, and then also um, 
they're known as the ASA. They help run a lot of the administrative work that goes on here at the office. So we have about two dozen in all uh, here at our office with various responsibilities. Well, this has been a fascinating and entertaining evening. Thank you so much for coming out and talking to us. Thank you for having me. It's been and a pleasure.